Uh, my name is Robert Breedlove. I'm here to talk to you guys today about Masters and Slaves of Money. This is an essay that I recently published on Medium, so I hope you'll get the chance to check it out. So, money is a tool for trading human time. Central banks are the modern era masters of money. They wield this tool as a weapon to inflict wealth inequality by stealing time. History shows us that the corruption of monetary systems leads to moral decay, social collapse, and slavery. As the temptation to manipulate money has always proven to be too strong for mankind to resist, the only antidote to this poison is an incorruptible money, Bitcoin. So to explain that a little bit, I'm going to start in history and I'll bring it forward to the Fed today. So in ancient Western Africa, there was a form of money called agribeads, which you guys may have read about in the Bitcoin standard. Uh, this was a small glass bead money that was used for centuries in Western Africa. And when European explorers appeared in Africa in the 16th century, it was quickly apparent to them that these small glass beads were very valuable to locals. So since glass making tech was uh, primitive in Africa, agribeads were reliably scarce to other goods and services, which gave them a monetary property that supported their value in the marketplace. Back in Europe, however, glass making tech was much more sophisticated and counterfeit glass beads virtually identical to, to agribeads could be mass produced at a low cost. Seizing this economic opportunity, many crafty Europeans soon began arranging, arranging expeditions from Western Africa, shipping in huge quantities of indistinguishably counterfeit agribeads into Africa. Uh, and the, these were basically just counterfeit beads fashioned back in Europe that they shipped into Africa. So as European ships arrived on African shores, many hulls with holes packed full of glass beads, locals readily traded their hard-earned assets for these counterfeit glass beads. And later, agribeads would became, become known as slave beads because as these newly impoverished African locals became desperate, some of them were forced to sell themselves or others into slavery as a result. So agribeads became known as slave beads, which were one of history's many monetary systems weaponized by counterfeiters um, because they were instrumental in the multi-century transatlantic slave trade, which is depicted here. So... The transatlantic slave trade was a 365-year atrocity. Over 12.5 million lives were directly confiscated from African shores and sent to Europe uh, and America. Over 2 million of these people died in transit, and this does not consider all their children born into slavery uh, issues we're still suffering from today. And so kind of in a barbaric irony of history, those, some of the same ships that came to African shores packed with glass beads, holes packed with glass beads, left with holes packed with slaves. And as you can see here, masters of slave ships packed their holes tightly with slaves in an inhumane and unforgivingly precise way. And unfortunately, agribeads were not the only isolated episode of counterfeit money leading to slavery. Another form of money called panos was a cloth strip money used in ancient Western Africa. Lured by a virtually limitless profit potential, Portuguese panos producers soon established a state-sponsored monopoly which mandated the use of its warehousing and trading post operations for all financial flows denominated in Panos. This monopoly enforced the use of Panos for tax payments to forcibly denominate slave trade contracts and to hire soldiers. And to name just one similar non-coincidental example today, the U.S. government enforces the use of dollars for tax collections as legal tender, as the nominal currency for all oil contracts worldwide, and as the international reserve currency. So the point of this is that when free market forces are manipulated, producers gain an asymmetric ability to set prices without regard to customer preferences, thereby converting an economic democracy, like a free market, into a dictatorship and freedom into tyranny. So for money, this implies that monopolists can acquire human time, aka labor, in the marketplace at an unfair price. Said differently, money monopolists can steal human time. This is a malevolent power that effectively makes them slave masters. So said simply, an exclusive right to produce money without regard for competitive market pressures is an apparatus of enslavement. It's a vile privilege that monopolists can only preserve through deception and violence. This dynamic forms a vicious cycle in which monopolists become de facto currency counterfeiters that monopolize money production and tax collection, use cheaply produced money to buy assets and hire soldiers. After impoverishing their trading partners with the cheaply produced money, they would conquer or enslave them. Then they would use those slaves to work in their money production facilities or other labor units, 
and then they will forcibly uh, protect that monopoly violently by suppressing competition um, and so on and so forth. So it's a really vicious, ugly cycle. So this, those are two old examples of how counterfeit money leads to slavery. And to quantify the transatlantic slave trade from an economic perspective, to compare it to today, not counting the children that were born into slavery, assuming that every slave could labor for 5,000 hours each year for 40 years, the this, this total time stolen comes to a staggering 2.5 trillion hours over 365 years. That's 6.8 billion hours stolen per year for 365 years straight. Yeah. So in a first principle sense, counterfeiting money is time theft, and time theft is enslavement. This is no joke. So systems of stealing human time, whether they are direct or indirect, can hardly be called anything other than slavery. And since money is redeemable for human time, those who violently monopolize its production are engaging in a form of slavery by stealing time incrementally from the users of money through counterfeiting operations. This unfreedom in the market for money also afflicts social morality. Because as Rothbard said, to be moral, an act must be free. Free actions can come only from sovereign individuals. Sovereignty itself, the word, refers to the locus of supreme, supreme power in the sphere of human action. Uh, very simply, sovereignty refers to your ability to act in the world as you see fit. And according to natural law, sovereignty inheres within the individual, as each person must consciously decide what actions to take regardless of what forces they face in the world. And so in this sense, an inner sanctum of sovereignty's generative source lives within all of us in this inviolable space called the Logos. And the Logos is a Greek word that actually means word or ratio. And the Logos is the defining feature of humanity, our ability to tell and believe stories like money, nation states, human rights, this is what separates man from animal. And at the foundation of Western civilization today is the precept that the sovereignty of the individual is held higher than the sovereignty of the state. And this is, this is an embodied belief in principles such as habeas corpus, the presumption of innocent until proven guilty, and freedom of speech rights. And as George Orwell once said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. An inability to speak the truth with words or to prove others wrong in the marketplace with prices is the death of liberty. As the 20th century so painfully taught us, restricting the logos is a slippery slope toward totalitarianism. Again, free expression in all forms is antecedent to proper moral action. So money chosen on the free market is a form of speech in and unto itself. Some people call it the language of value, right? So gold, for instance, was an expression of the collective logos in that it was a tool freely chosen for its monetary properties, not something imposed upon people. And in this sense, gold was a moral money because it was freely chosen. People were choosing the tool that best served them. And to comprehend money's impact on morality, let's consider the hypothetical case of a winemaker living in a centrally banked economy. So if a winemaker knows that a central bank just doubled the money supply to save the economy, he now faces three choices. He could continue selling his wine for $20 a bottle, taking a 50% loss in post-inflation dollars. He could water down his wine or use cheaper ingredients, sell his customer an inferior product. Or he could increase the price of his wine to $40 to maintain the quality of his wine and his margin post and in post-inflation dollars. So if a winemaker chooses to water down his wine, he's defrauding his customers, right? He's selling them an inferior product. But instead, he decides to be honest and double his price to maintain his quality and margin, he faces competition from other winemakers that are less scrupulous, that would be willing to compromise in quality. And since diluting wine with water is difficult to detect and offers an immediate financial gain, all winemakers in this situation face strong incentives to, to defraud their customers, basically. And when inflation strikes. So in a similar vein, monetary inflation incentivizes sellers across all industries to deceive their customers in the short run. So in this sense, inflation imposes the temptation of larceny onto sellers' hearts, forcing them to weigh their financial well-being against their moral integrity. And in this way, inflation is an infectious disease on society's moral fabric. Inflation-resistant money, then, is an antidote 
to an afflicted social morality. And in this sense, Bitcoin, the only money with a 0% terminal inflation rate in history, is a, an antidote to this moral affliction. And inflation really is, it's just the installation of theft directly into our primary trust network, which is money. It's, there's no equitable benefit to it whatsoever, despite all the Keynesian bullshit you may have heard. And, you know, frankly, it's, it's a mechanism for time theft, so it's an invisible form of slavery. And to quantify this modern form of invisible slavery, let's look at a more ancient form of visible slavery. So in ancient Egypt, Herodotus wrote that a single great pyramid required 100,000 men laboring for 20 years straight to construct. So again, if we assume each slave was working about 5,000 hours, that comes out to 10 billion human hours to build each great pyramid. But this is still less than the time stolen by the greatest pyramid schemes in history, fiat currencies. A pyramid scheme is defined as an investment scam based on a hierarchical setup of network marketing in which higher layer participants like banks profit at the expense of those lower down, like those holding USD as a store of value. Fiat currencies are pyramid schemes erected by central banks that restrict access to and suppress the price of gold which would otherwise outcompete their inferior monies in the marketplace. It may be hard to believe that the US dollar is a pyramid scheme, but I think its symbology tells its own story. So the pinnacle of the US dollar pyramid scheme is gold, a tool selected as money by the cumulative free choice or the collective logos of entrepreneurs throughout history. Gold was abstracted into paper money to make it more transactable, not to replace it. Over time, as many of us know, the option to redeem U.S. dollars for gold was revoked, um, and gave, which basically gave the U.S. government full control over currency scarcity and gave them an unlimited ability to confiscate wealth and time uh, at their discretion. So long as people remain sufficiently passive yet productive, these schemes can be built ever higher and continue to operate as a we weapon of wealth extraction for their political perpetrators. However, since there's no free lunches in this universe, this fiat currency supply expansion cannot continue forever. As layers continue to accumulate in round after round of quantitative easing, people are implicitly taxed harder and harder through price inflation, and trust in the currency becomes diminished. Like Hemingway said about bankruptcy, this happens gradually at first, then suddenly, as inflation gives way to hyperinflation. At this point, the central bank master has pushed his fiat slave citizen too hard, like to the edge of his economic livelihood. Now we can compare these pyramid schemes to Bitcoin, but to do so it's important to realize early adopters of any money always benefit disproportionately to later adopters. But unlike the unknowable supplies of fiat currencies which are vulnerable to political corruption, Bitcoin has a universally known and incorruptible supply of 21 million. For fiat currencies, the early adopters, quote unquote, are perpetually always those with access to the printing press. They're always first in line for new money. This is a positional asymmetry that makes the entire game unfair. For Bitcoin, early adopters are those smart enough to realize it is the most superior form of money the world has ever known. It's, it's more divisible, more durable, more recognizable, more portable, and more scarce than anything uh, we've ever had as money. 